Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a huge collection of videos on monster ecology, fantasy world history, cosmology, character classes and magic items on my channel. Time for some more magic artifact goodness, it's been a while since we've had one. This video I'm bringing what little is known about a shirt of silver mail called the Invulnerable Coat of Arnd. Although the history in print of this artifact goes all the way back to Eldritch Wizardry Supplement and First Edition Dungeon Master's Guide, little is known about its true origin. It is most likely to have been created on the world of Earth for the Greyhawk world setting. Dragon Magazine issued 299 on page 102 in an article which lists all known Greyhawk artifacts says that it is a defensive garment originally owned by High Priest Arnd of Tadong. If only scholars could agree on who or what Tadon was, there might be a decent chance of discovering this long lost artifact. The Book of Artifacts by David Cook, published in uh, 1993 by TSR, tells us that the invulnerable coat of Arnd is a shimmering bright coat of chainmail made from fine chain links of silver that cover the wearer's upper arms torso and groin, it also tells that scant details still remain of the people of a small ancient nation oppressed and impoverished by the wizard Vertos. All of the champions sent by the people to free them from Vertos's yoke failed. So with no one else willing to take up their cause, the priests and great craftsmen of the nation combined forces to create an incredible male coat, no doubt involving unknown sacrifice on their part for such an epic ritual. This artifact would endow the wearer with the courage and strength to defeat Vertos. When the coat was completed, the priests prayed to their gods for a champion. One week later, Arnd, a humble priest from the south, entered the city. He was not a warrior, he was just a good Samaritan. See, Arnd's clerical order believed strongly in aiding impoverished folk at any opportunity, and Arnd himself was the most dedicated follower who, after learning of the nation's plight, fronted up to the local clergy and agreed to don the coat and lead the masses into battle, because his god told him to. We don't know anything other than the victory was a resounding one, and Vertos was overthrown utterly. After the victory, the people wished to celebrate their hero, but Arnd had disappeared, taking the coat as a gift, or so the legend goes. The Epic Level Handbook by Andy Collins and Bruce Cordell, published by Wizards of the Coast in 2002, adds little to this account. It says that humanity was young when this nation in the west of Earth existed. So this is unknown historic territory for the Greyhawk world setting. The history of O-Earth is not as extensively documented as that of Toril, much past what would be 4477 BC on Earth or minus 4735 DR on Toril, so relatively young by the comparison of both those settings. So I'm assuming that this would be before the rise of the Siluiz Imperium, which certainly had more than its fair share of decadent and wicked wizard tyrants. And from the handbook, it says that this wizard was one of the first to master the arcane arts on Earth, so it fits that that would mean the invulnerable coat of Arnd is over 6,300 years old, give or take a few centuries, having untold numbers of owners over that time, with an immortal soul of a kind-hearted and strong-willed cleric bound inside it, somehow, who has been aware and occasionally active that entire time. The epic level handbook differs from earlier accounts in that it says that when a humble priest named Arnd arrived in the nation oppressed by the wizard king Vertos from his land of Tadon, or perhaps the land Vertos oppressed was called Tadon, Arnd prayed to his gods for mercy and was provided a vest of shimmering chain that would withstand the mightiest foe. This makes a bit more sense in that the artifact is certainly bound to Arn's spirit as we'll discover, which remains within it and causes the coat to resurface again and again, seeming to seek out new owners to wear the artifact into battle. So rather than being created by oppressed clerics, it was created by gods. Comparing the listings for the artifact, I think the original version fits 5th edition nicely, so the powers of the coat are as follows. As a constant effect, the coat grows or shrinks to fit any humanoid character from 3 to 8 feet tall who puts it on. It doesn't pick and choose who can wear it, which is unusual for a divine relic actually. 
The wearer is impervious to any physical attacks made on rolls than less than a natural 20 and gains a plus 5 bonus to all saving throws. The armor protects against fire attacks as a ring of fire resistance and is immune to acid, cold and electrical attacks. Any cleric wearing the armor and uttering a special prayer gains three levels of experience for four days, up to once per month. The cleric gains all the hit points, spells, attacks and saving throws associated with their new level of experience. Unfortunately, the spirit of Arndt still inhabits the armor and attempts to aid the poor whenever possible. While in the presence of impoverished or suffering people, there is a 70% chance that the spirit of Arndt will take possession of the wearer in order to aid the unfortunates. The wearer spends 2d4 plus 1 hours roaming the area, seeking out the poor and helping them as a 14th level cleric, even if the character is not a cleric, Arnd is. When the spirit of Arnd releases the character, no memory in that character remains of what happened while they were possessed. This raises so many questions. While Arnd is in control of the character's body, there's no reason why characters could not question Arnd on the incredible span of centuries that he has witnessed as an indestructible and immortal magical artifact. I mean, he has existed longer than almost every lich I can think of, and over six millennium he has outlived every gold dragon by a couple of thousand years. That is mind-boggling. Like most of Greyhawk's legendary lore and items, these artifacts have their origins in actual games played by the game's original creators and contributors. In an interview in Earth Journal No. 14, Rob Kuntz uh, revealed that the invulnerable coat of Arnd was briefly stolen by Boric, a human fighter played by Skip Williams, as he tried to make his escape from the Dark Druids module. Unfortunately for Boric, uh, he was slain by a Vrock, who dropped him from a great height, and Williams was made to believe by Kuntz that the coat had shattered in the same fall that killed Boric. But in reality, the Vrock, afraid to touch the artifact itself, alerted its superiors to the artifact's location and the coat was brought back to the temple area. Williams later confirmed this in an interview with Grognardia. As an artifact which travels from owner to owner, there is no reason why it wouldn't travel between realms, so it can certainly show up in any campaign setting you care to run. To destroy the coat of Arnd, there are a few suggested means. First, it can be unraveled link by link, but only by one without any conscience. Now, to me, that suggests it could be destroyed methodically, taken apart by a golem. Second, it can be destroyed by being fed to the father of all rust monsters. Who or what that is, my guess, is as good as yours. Third, a deity of avarice must be forced to wear the coat whereupon the magic is released violently, and the Book of Artifacts says to roll in the table of cataclysms. This table is no laughing matter, so tell you what, let's take a look at it and see if we can update it to 5th edition. Ooh, this should be fun. So, in relation directly to magical artifacts, what is known as a cataclysmic event can never be intentionally called upon by the artifact's owner. They occur at unplanned times, they take no sides, they also target the artifact's owner, and they affect an area one mile in diameter, with everything within that range being subject to the awful effects of the cataclysm. There are 20 events listed, so you can roll for one of them using a d20, they get successively worse the higher up the uh, number of the dice you get. Most of them have effects that are similar to specific spells, but of a vast and terrifying scale. I uh, have to consult the second edition AD&D Tome of Magic for some of these old school spells, and they are gnarly. Number one, Acid Storm. Everything that can't find shelter from the rain takes 3d4 acid damage at the start of each turn for no less than two turns. Doesn't sound that bad personally, but think about all the buildings, plants, animals, and people over that one mile area. The effect is absolutely horrific. Number two, area of desolation. Individuals of good alignment are haunted by terrifying dreams and suffer from the poison condition while they remain in the area. While evil individuals have advantage on attacks and ability checks, plants twist and wither, crops fail and herds grow sickly. This may be a permanent effect. Number three, 
blizzard. This is extreme and sustained extreme cold. Exposed creatures not immune or resistant to cold must succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw at the end of each hour or gain one level of exhaustion. There is also a strong wind which imposes disadvantage on ranged weapon attack rolls and wisdom perception checks that rely on hearing. And because the air is obscured by sleet and snow, this affects vision as well. Forget about setting campfires or carrying torches lit out in the open, and attempting to fly through it is a really bad idea. Either land at the end of the turn or fall to the ground. The storm lasts for 1d6 plus 12 hours and leaves the one mile area blanketed in a thick layer of snow. Number four. Lightning bombardment. This is spectacularly destructive. The air erupts in a towering thundercloud a mile wide and several miles high. Over the next 72 hours, it constantly spits random bolts of lightning, up to 432 bolts over that area in that duration. Each inflicts 40-10 lightning damage to any creature within 5 feet of where it strikes. They can make a DC 16 dexterity saving throw for half damage if they successfully dodge the strike. Characters in the area might have to dodge a few bolts, but the overall effect seems a hell of a lot more dangerous because there's no telling where a bolt is going to strike next, so you may be running straight into one. Number 5. Atmosphere of Death Yellow-green fog fills the entire one mile area for 1d6 hours. When a creature enters this area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, that creature must make a DC 14 constitution saving throw. The creature takes 5d8 poison damage on a failed save, half as much damage on a successful one. Creatures are affected even if they hold their breath or don't need to breathe. This will wipe out all plant and animal life in the area, guaranteed. Number 6. Ring of Creeping Doom this summons thousands of swarms of biting and stinging insects. Treat them exactly like a swarm of centipedes, that which is listed. They appear at the outer edge of the one mile radius and move like a solid blanket inexorably inward, not reducing significantly in number until they reach the epicenter in about four hours time. Then they slowly disperse again after several more hours, leaving a ravaged and infested landscape in their wake. You can imagine... If this effect goes off from the artifact and you're like, well, that wasn't so bad. And then a few hours later, this creeping doom arrives. Number seven, death fog. A pale fog rises from the ground, lasting 2d20 rounds. Each round, a living creature begins its turn inside this fog. They must roll a DC 16 constitution saving throw or suffer 5d6 necrotic damage. The fog colour changes to become increasingly dark red the more damage it inflicts on creatures. Number 8. Supernatural Drought All water present or brought into the area of effect evaporates instantly. This can last for days, weeks, months or even years. That's open water sources by the way, or water in canteens and things. It doesn't just shrivel up living creatures that have got water in them. Oh well, eventually it would. Number 9. Earthquake, same as the 8th level spell, but over a 1 mile area. Number 10, Firestorm, same as the 7th level spell, but over a 1 mile area. Number 11, Flood, see the Control Weather 4th level spell for the Flood effect. Over this huge area, the effects are much more severe though. Number 12, Incendiary Cloud, the same as the 8th level spell, but over a 1 mile area. Number 13, Insect Plague, same as the 5th level spell, but again, 1 mile area. Number 14 is Dead Magic Zone, as the 8th level anti-magic field, but over a 1 mile area. Number 15, Meteor Swarm, as per the 9th level spell, but over a 1 mile area and striking randomly. Number 16, getting more complicated, we're going back uh, for the Spiral of Degenerations. This is a high level old school spell that disrupts reality and is devastating to all magical effects, spells, magic users, magic items, aside from artifacts, which are not affected by this sort of thing. There is a 50% chance each round that a degeneration effect will occur to those within the one mile zone. When this happens, two events take place. First, Spellcasters lose one spell slot from each level of spell that they can cast, as though the spell had been cast already. Well, all of those spells. They can regain these the usual way later on. Second, 
Magic items are affected in the following ways. Weapons and armor lose one level of enchantment, so a plus one sword becomes a non-magical sword. Items that carry magical charges lose 1d10 of those charges as though they've been spent already. Temporarily enchanted items without bonuses or charges make a saving throw, DC 15, and based on the constitution save of whoever is carrying them. If they fail, they become non-magical, permanently. Potions lose all magic, scrolls lose one randomly determined spell inscribed on them, and permanently enchanted items such as wondrous items temporarily lose all those enchanted effects until they leave the one mile area. Within the mile, all magical communication, divination and telepathy is disrupted and people can't even speak intelligibly to each other. It just comes out as random disjointed babble, like someone casts his tongue spell in reverse. This cataclysmic effect is permanent over the entire one mile area. Number 17. Wild Zone. A permanent disruption similar to conditions found in wild magic regions. In the one mile area, any attempt to cast a spell or use a magic item that expends a charge on activation results in a wild magic surge, as found on page 104 of the player's handbook. This doesn't affect non-spell or non-charge using magic items or creatures with spell-like abilities though. Number 18, Plane Shift. This transports an entire one mile area to another plane of existence, but whatever artifact causes this to happen remains behind. The transported land, animals, plants and structures don't come back automatically. Unless they find their own way, they're there to stay. Number 19, Storm of Vengeance. Essentially, this is an increasingly devastating effect over the one mile area that summons the mother of all storms. On the first round, there is a massive dark cloud and tremendous collapse of thunder, requiring a DC 12 constitution saving throw or everyone becomes deafened. On the second round, there is a downpour of acid rain, just like the first cataclysm effect I mentioned. On the third round, it creates a lightning storm, with anyone not undercover having to make a DC 16 dexterity saving throw, or they get hit with a 4010 lightning bolt uh, from this huge thundercloud. On the fourth round, there is a bombardment of massive hailstones that cause 3d10 bludgeoning damage pretty much to anything on the ground and uh, in the air, and on the fifth round, the entire area is blanketed in thick fog as per the fog cloud spell. Number 20, Summon Guardian Spirits, calls forth 2d4 plus 2 fiendish spirits as per the sixth level spell. These are under the control of nobody, but won't destroy normal animal life or plants, just intelligent creatures, humanoids, monsters, and structures in the area. They'll eventually return to wherever they came from when they lose interest. Typically this is when there's nothing left in the area that they want to destroy, um, kill, torture, maim, you name it. As you can see, cataclysmic effects from artifacts are to be avoided at all costs under all but the most hopeless circumstances and are justifiably feared by any who know just how bad it can get. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for all the full scripts for these vids, buy some sweet merchandise from my Teespring shop, wear your geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening. Don't forget you can access the script for this video on Patreon, it's just a dollar per month and uh, all of the scripts are listed there including this table of uh, 20 cataclysmic events and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.